If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, last week of course was kind of a short uh, type of uh, study because we had business meeting and tonight uh, we will go back into chapter 10 and finish chapter 10 and uh, hopefully we'll even get in chapter 11 tonight we'll just see how far we can get. But uh, let's all stand tonight and we'll read there in uh, Romans chapter 10 and uh, verses 1 through 5. Of course, Paul is writing to us and he's telling us this about his heart. And he says there in verse 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses, uh, Moses, uh, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. We've kindly been studying that, that the law is kind of what these Jews were wanting to live under, even though God had brought his grace and mercy in, they still kind of wanted to live by the law because they thought that was the way that they were supposed to live. But Paul's coming in now and he is preaching and teaching to them about grace and mercy, what Jesus did for us on the cross. How that he washes all of our sins away. That it's only through his blood that we have forgiveness. And his sacrifice. The book of Romans is full of these and full of that. So let's talk about it again tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, your long-suffering towards us. We thank you, Father, for being right here with us tonight. And we ask that, Lord, that you will bless us once again with your presence. Holy Spirit, we give you the right to do whatever you want to here tonight. And Father, we just pray that as we leave this place in our heart, we will know that surely it's been good to be in your house. Father, this is a place of rest. And this is a place where we can come in in one accord and, and love on you and Thank you for what you've done for us. Help us to worship tonight. Help us to worship through your word. In your precious sweet name we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Now go to somebody tonight and tell them you love them. Don't shake hands, but just tell them you love them. They'll understand. As I've kindly commented on, the problems for the Jews here in Romans was that they bound themselves to the law. And they attempted to keep the law, but they really didn't understand within themselves that it's impossible to do that. And we all understand that now, know that. But, well, some do. Some still try to live by the law. But Jesus actually called the law a curse because no man was ever able to keep it. No one except him, of course. He talks about that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. I'm not going to read it because we've already looked at that. But we have to understand tonight that the purpose of the law was to reveal man's sin. It was to show us who we are. It was to show us that we do have sin in our lives, that we do have unrighteousness in our lives, and the purpose of the law was to point men and women to Christ. It was to show us the righteousness of God, that He was the only one that had ever kept the law. We talked about last week how Paul's desire was for Israel. We looked at that in his prayer, and it says that in verse 1. It says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. We even studied that a little bit over in Romans chapter 9 and verse 
3, when he talked about that he wished he'd be accursed, even if it took that, for the salvation of uh, the Jews, for them to understand how to be saved and, and that the law was not the way of doing that. I mean, Paul's heart and desire was to see these Jews know the Lord Jesus Christ. It ought to be our heart and our desire tonight to see people know Jesus. Everybody we come in contact with, we ought to want them to be saved and to understand that Jesus loves them and Jesus is the only way out of this world alive. And I'm here to tell you right now, the more that and the older that you get and the more friends that you have and the things that you understand about the love of Jesus, everybody you know, every friend you have, you want them to know and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So his prayer. But then in Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, we're not going to read that, but we see their ignorance about this. Their ignorance. These people had a zeal for God, but, and they, they really wanted to know him, but they wanted to do it in a wrong way. They, they wanted to worship him with zeal, but they wanted to do it in the wrong way. And Paul even calls it out in verses 2 through 4. He calls it out and he said they went about to establish their own righteousness. They tried to make it on their own. And by the way, folks, it never works when you're trying to make it to heaven on your own. He said, rather, they should have submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. My righteousness is as filthy rags. My righteousness comes from Him. That's where I get it from. It's not me. It's not you. It's not the works you do or anything else that will get you to heaven. Secondly, we talked about Moses' description of the law. The first thing he talked about there was its righteousness. And he says in Romans chapter 10 verse 5, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. You see... The law tonight restrained men and women from sin. It gave them boundaries. It gave us guidelines so that we might know how to obey God and to live in fellowship with Jesus. But I'm here to tell you, however, the law never saved anyone. And it never will. It never saved anyone from sin. All the law does is reveal our sin. It just shows us who we are. It's a mirror that we can look into and know who we are and what we've done wrong. And then we've seen in this heading of Moses' description of the law last week, we saw its requirements, not only its righteousness, but its requirement. Its requirement is found in verse 5 also when it says this. It says that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. You see, the only way a person could receive righteousness from the law was to live by the law and to live to the very letter of the law. And folks, no one can do that. Since the law is not faith, that creates a problem also. Because it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 about faith, what does it say there? For grace, are you saved through what? Faith. It's faith. You and I have to have faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our salvation. We know that he died for us. We know that he rose again for us. We know that we have faith in him. And that's how we're saved. That's how we go to heaven through salvation. The third thing we talked about last week was Christ's plan of salvation. There's a wrong assumption about it. And that's found out there in Romans 10, verses 6 and 7. And what that says in a nutshell is this. Paul's saying, quit looking for another way. People need to quit looking for another way to heaven. They need to quit looking for another Messiah. Jesus is the one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's already come. It's already done. Salvation's plan is in place tonight. And I'm thankful for it, aren't you? So tonight, this is new. Let's go into this. Man's need of a preacher. You see, we need preachers. The Bible tells us that. 
We need men that will stand and preach the truth about God's Word. And folks, we need more of them in this day and time. A question's posed here. I want to show it to you in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? What Paul said. How can they hear these things without a preacher? In verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now Paul had no problem saying this, and he was one. He had no problem saying it because it's what God gave him to write down about it. And to preach about it. You see, there's an important fact that we need preachers. They need to preach the golden message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the golden message is the message of hope. It's the message of salvation. And I'm here to tell you tonight, we need to take it to others. Those that teach Sunday school classes and those that that teach in ministries outside the church. I'm here to tell you, people need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason we support missions. Because we want other countries to know about Jesus. We We want places in our own United States that don't have a lot of churches that preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to send men there to preach the word. Why? Because it's important. Why? Because men's souls are searching for the truth. And the way you give them the truth is through preachers and teachers and missionaries as they go forth in this old world. So we see a question posed about the preacher. And then we see a statement given in verse 16 and 17. He says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Isaiah said here, not all have obeyed the gospel. It it was not that the Jews had not heard it. It was just that they didn't believe it. About like it is today. A lot of people hear things about the Lord Jesus Christ and hear the Word of God. Folks, we live in a country that you can just about 24 hours a day turn on your television set and hear a message on TV. Now, I'm not saying all those messages are right. But there are some good ones on there. We live in a country where the gospel is put into every home and everybody knows about the Lord Jesus Christ, but it doesn't mean that they believe in Him. How do they believe in Him? Well, Paul says it's very simple. Here's the way they believe, Romans 10, 17. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. You see, to believe in Him, you have to believe the Word. That's the reason I get upset when people attack the Word. When people try to take away from the Word or take from the Word, you better leave the Word alone because the Lord does not like that. It's truth. And we better teach it and preach it as truth with truth because that's the way God wants it. So Paul says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You'll remember that Isaiah spoke of Christ in the Old Testament, and I'm going to read that because I just thought it was very important that we hear this again. It's some of my favorite scripture out of Isaiah 53. It says there, He is despised and rejected of a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it, if it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
But he was wounded, now listen, for he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, it pleased the Lord to, bru to bruise him. He hath put him to grieve. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. There it is again. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's us. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what Paul was trying to say. This is who Jesus is, and this is what he done for you, and this is why you're saved by grace. Thirdly, a reproof delivered here. In Romans 10, 18 through 21, it says, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no, no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Here it is, the Gentiles. But Esaias is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all the day long I have stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gangsaying people. Paul said, he came for you. The Jews, you're his people. He loves you. And he wants to save you. But because they disbelieved in him, he said, I'm going to bring, I'm going to graft those Gentiles in. I'm going to bring them into the fold. Aren't you glad tonight he brought us into the fold? I'm glad too. I'm glad he loved me enough to save me. You see, Israel's problem was, they, uh, was not that they hadn't heard. Rather, it was because they had stubbornness in them. A lot of people are stubborn when it comes to this. They were stubborn when it came to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever talked to somebody and tried to witness them about Jesus? And they'll say, I don't want to hear that stuff. Boy, they need to hear that stuff. They need to listen really good because their eternal life depends on that stuff. You know what, folks? The old devil is a liar and he'll take everyone to hell with him that he can. You see, these Jews, they were even provoked to jealousy by the Gentiles. The Gentiles were despised that's you and I. That was them back then, but that's you and I. The Gentiles were despised by the Jews because of what Jesus did for them. God in His mercy. God in His, grace, His great mercy and His great grace turned to the Gentiles and provided salvation. We see that in verse 19. But again, he refers to the Gentiles in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 20, when he says, But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. 
That's us. In Isaiah 65, 1, God said, I am sought of them that ask not of me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold, behold, unto a nation that was not called by my name. He loved us. He grafted us in. I'm glad that he turned to the Gentiles, aren't you? We wouldn't be saved if he had not given us the good news. In verse 21, the Lord expresses his displeasure to Israel about the way they're acting. He saith unto them, All the day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And he said, I've tried and tried with you. I've stretched forth my hands to you to try to show you the truth and try to give you the truth. And you've turned your back on me again. So many people turn their back on Jesus. You're here tonight and you know how long you turned your back on Jesus. I did too. He would call me in a setting like this. He would convict my heart in church just about every time I went and I'd walk out the doors as lost as I was when I went in. I am so glad he didn't quit calling my name. I'm glad he loved me enough to save me, aren't you? I tell you, if the truth be known tonight and if we were honest, all of us need to be on the altar and just thank him for saving our souls. We're not worthy, folks. I'm not worthy. But I'm thankful, aren't you? I'm thankful tonight that he saved me and that he loved me. He warns Israel here. And he not only said it to Israel, but to all people. And what he was saying is that God's patience does have an end to it. One of these days, his patience is going to come to an end on this old earth. And the eastern sky is going to split open and the church is going to go out. And those that died in Christ, he's going to take them out of their graves and take them home. Amen. Graves will pop open, that's what the Bible says. Because his patience is going to run out. And then tribulation on this earth is going to be like it's never been before. Tonight I was listening to uh, our news, our local news, and they said just in the last month we've had 13 earthquakes in the state of Tennessee. And then they talked to some old, well, I ain't going to say that, some old guy out at ETSU. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I don't know if it's a lot or not. I think it's just, a, uh, I thought to myself, well, you're goofy. We don't hear, it. We don't hear people having earthquakes. We don't hear no earthquakes in the last... 50 years I've been here, but, but anyway, like 13 in one month? Good grief. He said, well, we don't have the equipment to do this and do that. I said, well, you felt it, didn't you? Somebody did. But anyway, folks, he said in the end times that those things would increase. We're here in the state of Tennessee. I know there's a fault line runs down right down in the middle of the state just about. I know that. But you know what? Everything's on the increase, especially wickedness. Wickedness. One of these days, God's patience is going to run to the end. People need to be saved right now. You need to get busy. I need to get busy. People need to know about Jesus. We don't have a lot of time. We, we can't be scared anymore. We've got to come right out and tell people we're Christians. That we love the Lord. There's an opportunity right now for people to be saved. The Holy Spirit is moving. God showed us that Sunday morning when that young woman right there got saved. That's a miracle. She was sitting the fourth row back right there. You know what she did? She wrote me that night. This is the truth. She wrote me that night and said, please pray for my husband. He's not saved. And I thought to myself, boy, when somebody gets saved, the Lord, the next thing he does is start them looking out for those that are not saved. You need to pray for her husband. She wants him saved. I think that's a good request, don't you? 
In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 21, 24 through 31, talking about, you know, that God has this patience, but his patience is going to run out. Listen to what he says here in Proverbs 1, 24 through 31. He says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when, you, when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When your distress and your anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Listen to this. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices that's what God says you said man that's tough why would God say that that's tough because there's coming a day when his patient it, patience is going to run out there's people here on Sundays and on Sunday nights sometimes that that they're not saved and they come every Sunday and every Sunday night to church somewhere and they're not saved and one of these days God's patience is going to run out. And we need to understand that. Do you understand that tonight? Amen. God's a good God. He's a gracious God and a, and a loving God, but His patience is going to run out. God, God's salvation is simple. It's really simple tonight. It's faith in Christ. It's believing that He died for our sins, and then what we do, believing He died for our sins, we accept Him into our hearts as our personal Savior. Now, that's a simple plan of salvation. Isn't that great? It's exactly what John 3.16 says. I love that verse. Listen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. What a good verse. Well, let's go into chapter 11 for just a moment tonight. I won't bore you too long, but I think we need to at least get through some of it and just talk about it for a minute. Tonight, on this message, in this chapter, it's entitled, A Remnant According to Redemption. And we're going to look at verses probably 1 through 6 for just a moment, but I'm not going to read them right now. I'm going to read them after a, a, a moment. But as we look here in chapter 11 of Romans, it has to do again with Israel's election. You remember we talked about that in chapter 9. The, the saving of a remnant, which is Israel, uh, where God would spare these Jews. But not only would He spare the Jews, but... Through His grace and through His mercy, He would also save the Gentiles. And we've been talking about that in chapter 10. How would He do that? Well, He'd graft them in. He'd graft them into Israel. And that's presented, if you ever want to study it, by the olive tree. If you ever studied the olive tree, you will understand that. It's presented there, how we were grafted in and how God grafted us into His plan. God promised Abraham... These words, and I want you to listen. In these shall all the nations of the world be blessed. That's what he said. Through you. In thee, Abraham, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. So how did the process take place? Well, chapter 11 tells us that. I want you to look, first of all, at Abraham's people. We see that, that he hath not cast them away. And I want you to look there in verses 1 through 5. It says here in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 11, I say then, hath God cast away his people? Listen to what he says, God forbid. For I am also, uh, I'm also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast, us, cast away his people which he foreknew. Wot you not? 
what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? What did God say to, to this prophet about this? He said, I'm the only one left. That's what he said. I, I'm here on this earth, and I'm the only one that, that knows you. I'm the only one left because everybody else has hated you. Nobody believes in you, and I'm the only one left. And then listen to what God said to him about this. He said, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul's using the story of Elijah here. Oh, Elijah, you know, he was hiding there in a cave from Jezebel. He was running from that woman, you know. He thought that woman was going to kill him. And so he was hiding from her, scared to death. And, and he was all down and out, and he was uh, saying these words, and... Um, he thought he was the only prophet left alive. He thought he was the only one that would spread the good news. But God told him, he said, no, there's 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to Baal. And in the same way, the Lord is saying there is still a remnant in Israel, is what he's saying, who have not bowed after, uh, uh, to the altar of unbelief. They still believe. They still know me. In Romans 11, 5, it says, Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Of course, the same is true today. I want you to understand that today most people, now I, I will be honest with you, most people have rejected God. Especially in this old world we live in. I'm telling you folks, I have never seen a rejection of God like we live in in today. They've got partial, you know, as the Bible said it would be in the end times, you know, they, they, they got this partial, some kind of partial belief system, you know, where they can think they can live this way and this way and all that. It don't work. And it never will work. And God said it won't work. You're either in or you're out. I mean, that's the truth with God. But... Most people in our day and time around the world, I'm glad we live right here in the Bible Belt, but I'm here to tell you it's getting bad here too, but most people around the world have rejected the things of God. They will not have Him rule over their lives. That's a big thing right now, you know. We don't want nobody ruling over us. We're our own boss. However, thank God there are those who by faith tonight, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, have turned to Christ and, and praise the, the name of the Lord. Even tonight, while I'm speaking, in some church somewhere, I'm sure there's people getting saved somewhere. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? You want to know why? Because the Holy Spirit's still working. He's still alive and well, just like we've seen Sunday. He, he's still working. He can still draw men and women to Christ. Maybe you're not saved tonight. I'm here to tell you, you know that he's tried and tried to draw you to him. You just need to give in to him and ask him into your heart. Because he'll save you. He loves you. Secondly, he saved them by grace. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. There's a remnant according to the election of grace, and if by grace, then it, is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, it's no more work. Work is no more work. Now, I want to explain that a little bit. Because what God is saying here is that, and, and what Paul is saying here to these Jews, he's saying it again, he's reiterating it to these people again salvation is not by the law salvation is by grace through Jesus Christ I know we went over that and over it but for some reason God wanted us to know that amen it's completely by God if a person is saved 
I want you to know it's not something that we work for. It's not something that we earned. It's all in Christ if a person's saved. It's God's unmerited favor towards us. Somebody asked me one day, said, why does God love me that much? I'm dirty, filthy, rotten. And that's, that's the worst, that's the thing about winning somebody to Christ. They'll say things like, I need to clean up before I get saved. They think they can clean themselves up before they can get saved. Listen, you can't clean yourself up. The only one that can clean you up is Jesus Christ. And I always say to them, boy, if you're going to do that, you're going to be going a long time. Because you'll never clean yourself up. Only He can clean you up. You remember how you felt when you got cleaned up? Well, I do. I'll never forget it. It was like a boulder taken off my shoulders. I mean, when I got up from giving my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, it was just like He had just... Man, I'm telling you, I felt as light as a feather. I just felt like everything in my life had, had just gone away. All that old uh, sin... And I just felt so good. I'll never forget it. You see, tonight, when people reject God and they don't love Him, then they don't understand what we're talking about here tonight. Salvation is by grace. It's completely by God. If you're saved, it's by Him. It's nothing you work for or earned. His unmerited favor. No person will ever go to heaven and say, well, I was able to get here by what I've done. No. You won't get there that way. The Bible says in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I love those verses, don't you? You know, those verses are kind of the verse that brings you back down to who you are and how we got there. They're foundational verses, is what I call them, that, that we know that if it wasn't through, by Him, then we're not there. But if it's by Him, if we got saved through Him, that we're saved. You see, the only part that you and I ever have or ever will have in salvation is one thing, belief. If you didn't believe, you're not saved. It's belief. That's what God wants. He wants our belief. He wants us, when we get on our knees, to say to Him, You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. I cannot get saved. I cannot be cleaned but through you. That's what He wants us to say. It's simple, isn't it? Why do people make it so hard? They make it hard because, listen, folks, we need to understand what Jesus has for us. It's belief. That's the only way to get saved. To believe the gospel story. Accept Him into our lives. Remember, a person is condemned by unbelief. It's the truth. And that's what, that's what the majority in Israel was. They had unbelief. They didn't believe in Jesus. And they perished. You remember the story. Because of their unbelief, they perished in the wilderness. You remember that? They perished because of their unbelief. Hebrews 3.19 says, So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. That's talking about the Israelites in the wilderness. The last thing, Israel's blindness. They had a willing ignorance. Romans eleven seven says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeth for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What's he saying? What was Israel seeking? Paul said they were seeking righteousness by the law. They were seeking to justify themselves through their good works. That's what they were seeking. And we need to preach against that today. And we need to tell people that's not the way. In Romans 10, 3, it said this, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's what he said. They were going after their own righteousness. 
and trying to establish their own righteousness through works instead of submitting themselves to, to the righteousness of God. And the dra- tragedy in, in ending this message tonight of the whole thing is that they willfully, they willfully chose to reject Christ. They turned from the truth. And they continued in their self-effort to get to heaven. And some of you know people like that tonight. They've made the Bible what they think it is instead of the truth. They live by their own Bible. And you can't go to heaven that way. How many understand that? Zechariah 7, 11 says it this way, but they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder. That means they were stubborn and stopped up their ears that they should not hear. And there's a lot of people like that tonight who has done the same thing. I love you tonight. I, I'm glad we got to study together. I hope the book of Romans is a as exciting to you as it is to me I've learned so much i have just eaten it up I just love it I love studying the book of Romans and I hope it's exciting to you let's bow our heads tonight thank you Father thank you for loving us the way that you do thank you for your mercy and your grace and your long suffering towards us thank you for this time we spent together here tonight Now, you may be here tonight and you may need to come. I don't know what you're praying about, only you know. But whatever it is, it's between you and God, unless you want me to pray with you, and I'll do it. But if you need to come tonight, will you step out from where you are and come? Welcome to come. Maybe you're praying for some neighbor or some son or daughter or friend that you know that doesn't know the Lord. Would you come tonight? all stand tonight. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Don't forget Sunday, bring somebody with you. Uh, It's supposed to snow a little bit Sunday, but I don't think it's supposed to amount to much.